Welcome to a special edition of Hard Talk from the headquarters of the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. Now, the IMF is at the center of international efforts to stabilize the fragile global economy. I'm joined today by an audience of delegates to the IMF's annual spring meetings and by my special guest, the managing director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde. Now, she says that the task right now is to, is to <laughs> move, <laughs> thank you, is to move from a fragmented three-speed world economy to a full-speed world economy. It is a neat phrase, but how is it to be done? Well, that's roughly what I'm going to say. Okay. Uh, let's well see done. if I can. That's good. Well, it wasn't quite perfect. Let's see if I can do it now. Okay, is everybody ready? And um, when I've done that little business at the top, I'm going to invite you all to give Christine a welcome, and then we truly will get going. Okay? So. So that's, that's for real now. It, for, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you getting bored already? No, uh, no I right. just want to get ready. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but we are nearly there. Right. Um, team, tell me. Okay. Okay. Welcome to a special edition of Hard Talk from the headquarters of the International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. Now, the IMF, of course, is at the center of efforts to revitalize the fragile world economy. Today, I'm joined by an audience of delegates to the annual spring meetings of the IMF and by my special guest, the managing director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde. Now, she says the task is to move the world economy from a fragmented three-speed position to a full-speed world economy. It is a neat phrase, but how is it to be done? Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Christine Lagarde. <laughs> Christine Lagarde, let's start with a broad overview, a sweep across the world economy today. Do you feel that a, a sense of deep uncertainty still hangs over the world economy? There is still uncertainty but there is uh, probably less uncertainty than we had uh, a few months back. Um, as you mentioned, we have this uh, three-speed recovery underway, uh, which is you know, essentially the emerging market economies and the developing uh, countries, which are moving sort of not full speed ahead, but quite fast, and which have uh, sustained the crisis uh, relatively well and coming out of it reasonably solidly. You have then a second group of countries, essentially the United States of America and a few other countries like Sweden, Switzerland, uh, that have done quite a lot of reforms, particularly in their financial sector, that they have recapitalized, restructured, but have real issues, particularly the US, with their fiscal consolidation. Are they going too fast now? Yes. Are they going solidly and, and steadily for the future, anchoring their program in the medium term? No, and that's an issue. So and so then you have the let's start there. Very serious. Do you, you don't the want United the third States. one? Well, I do, but but uh, just to be clear about it, you're not happy with uh, economic management in the United States at the moment. We believe that the uh, the, the fiscal uh, policies in place are are, are not positioned uh, correctly. We believe that at the moment they're doing too much of it. They are contracting by about 1.8%, which is a lot relative to the size of growth that we forecast for them, which is a little less than 2%. Uh, and they are not telling us what they plan for the medium term. And yet we know that they're going to have massive entitlement weight on their economy, which would require that they indicate for the medium term what they're planning on doing. Well, so it's, it's, it's not balanced as it should be. I hope we can get back to that. And I rudely interrupted your, your uh, depiction well, never of rude. the third, the third <laughs> speed. Um, and I'm suspecting that when we get to the third speed, and the pro this is the most problematic area of the world economy, we are essentially talking about Europe. We're talking about Europe, particularly the Eurozone, and Japan, which is a bit, you know, in, in, in a place of its own for all sorts of reasons that maybe we will discuss. But yes, 
uh, it's Europe and the Eurozone in particular that we see in you know, a very, very mild recession for 2013 and picking up gently but not fast in 2014. So that's the slowest of the three groups and it's one that really needs to pursue significant reforms uh, as they have begun doing. Well, I think we have to focus um, this conversation at the beginning on Europe. I want to quote to you words actually from your chief economist, Olivier Blanchard, who said, the world economy is as weak as its weakest link. And, and just to be clear about it, you see Europe as the weakest link right now. Talking in general terms, yeah. yeah. This, is, this is the weakest link. And uh, his point about is as, as weak as the weakest link uh, has to do with how interconnected Absolutely. we all are. So if one player is weak, if one player is down, if one growth is slow, it is going to have an impact on all the other economies. So let's look at the strategy which Europe and the Eurozone in particular and other governments in, in Europe are, are employing right now. And let's talk about austerity because it's become the focus of so much debate mm. that involves the IMF. Bluntly, is austerity, as being practiced in Europe right now, going too far? It is no longer working. Two points here. Austerity of its own, on its own, that is fiscal consolidation, reduction of deficit, trying to uh, change the trajectory of debt to make it go down rather than up, uh, on its own would not be sufficient. Okay? In the same vein, monetary policy alone would not be sufficient. Structural reforms on its own would not be sufficient. So you need the three together. Structural reforms, many are needed in many European countries. Monetary policy, it is now you know, in, in good gear, if you, if you will, because it has moved into unconventional territories and it is helping particularly the financial sector and the banking sector to have money around. That was cre critical. And to also give the indication that if things go wrong on the markets, whereas countries are doing well and are really adjusting, then they will be around to interfere. But I suppose what, what I'm getting at is that I'm seeing signs that the IMF uh, approach to austerity is evolving. And I, was, evolving I, was, quite, I was coming to that. Quite, yeah. quite quickly. And it's because no. the conditions well. in Europe, far from improving, are in some ways deteriorating. Yes? I was coming to that. Uh, we are coming out very gradually of the worst possible recession since the Second World War. And it's a very complicated and complex crisis. Sure, which but, is but if you live in, if no, you live that, in Spain, that, if you live in yeah. Greece, if you live in a, in a host of periphery countries in Europe, you do not feel you are coming out of recession at all. You are not yet coming out of recession, but I'm, I just want to, you know, come from here and narrow down to, to those countries. So very complex um, uh, background landscape, financial crisis, real estate crisis, and you know this dichotomy between real economy and, and the markets. And in that context, uh, fiscal consolidation had to take place. In other words, those big deficits had to be reduced. Now, the question that we ask now, and that you know, is, is, has to be asked, is, is it going too fast? Is it going too deep? And is it being efficient? And we're clearly saying that for some countries, it has to uh, slow down. The pace was too fast. And they have room to maneuver and to let growth pick up a little bit. Which countries do you see going too fast now in terms of this austerity squeeze? Well, I'll give you one very good example, which I hope is going to turn around uh, shortly. And that is the Netherlands. The, ne the Netherlands had a very strict fiscal consolidation program. And uh, we, we thought, based on you know, the dialogue that we have, particularly in relation to this Article 4 that we do on an annual basis, and the follow-up visits that we pay to the country, that the Netherlands had room to maneuver, and that they did not have to rush into yet another 4 billion euros of fiscal consolidation. They just decided that. It's a debated issue. It's hard. Controversial in Parliament, it, but they're clearly heading in that direction. Well, you talk now, about controversial. I just want to mention one other country where it is mm. controversial. That is the United Kingdom. Really? Hmm. <laughs> you, 
your own chief economist, Olivier Blanchard, I've quoted him already, is now very specific. Uh, he says, quote, it may be time now to adjust the original fiscal consolidation plan of George Osborne, of course, the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the United Kingdom. He said that Osborne is playing with fire because conditions have deteriorated, but the government's policy hasn't changed. You back those words? You know, I think what's important is the collective uh, wisdom that we try to put together between all the departments. And uh, the department of, of Olivier, which is the research department, is clearly a very important factor in our, in our thinking. So when, when, when we say collectively that uh, it, it may be time, it should be considered, uh, we certainly uh, have a collective view. Uh, and, but and this, clearly, to be clear, this, this is urgent, isn't it? Because you and Mr. Blanchard and others have been delivering a message for some time that reassessment is needed based on the conditions in the wider economy. The conditions in the wider economy are poor. One can look at all of the figures in the UK. One can look at the credit ratings agencies. Another one today downgrading Britain from AAA. You know, the, 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 the economic medicine isn't working at the moment, it seems. Well, let and me, therefore, let, yeah. is it not time for you to say, enough of this sort of review and reassessment procedure, now you need to shift course? You know, First of all, I don't think that we can actually say that we have shifted, okay? Because for the last couple of years, we have been saying this is a very ambitious and very strong program. And clearly, one has to keep in watch what is the growth, uh, what is the environment, what are the constraints. So we've, we've consistently said that. And uh, it's not a new view that we would, we would be coming up with. Well, what Second is new, if I may say so, can I just, uh, just add mm, this? And sure. I'm sure you've seen it. The Financial Times, a very respected newspaper, now talking about a major dust-up, to use their phrase, brewing between the IMF and the British government. Because aides to the Chancellor are saying, quote, if they, the IMF, recommend loosening fiscal policy, we simply won't do it. They are wrong. Well, I, I don't know about this strange boys' language about punch up and all the rest of it. This is, this is not how we operate. Well, you know, dust up. A punch up. But the, 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 the point is, is, is there that, that you at the IMF and the British government now seem to have a serious difference on this key issue of how to manage, as you call it, fiscal consolidation, and at the same time, how to revive an economy and get growth going. Stephen, we've, we've always had the same line, which is to say that countries that uh, have a long way to go, and, and Britain came from an 11% deficit, have to uh, conduct fiscal consolidation consistently, giving a medium-term objective and giving both reliability and confidence that these policies will be put in place. That's point number one. Point number two, we've also consistently said that clearly one has to take into account the environment and the growth uh, that applies to the country. I would observe that the UK has some positive growth and that it's forecasting some positive growth for next year. So with these two parameters in mind, which are exactly what the IMF as an institution together with its research department uh, think, we are obviously going to have a dialogue because we don't do dust up, we have dialogue. Uh, with authorities, we're going to sit down at the time of the Article 4 review, which is when we spend three weeks going under the numbers and exploring you know, why this is working, why this is not working, is the current uh, account in a better shape, are exports working, is the funding for lending program that has been very well put in place by the Bank of England working, and if not, why not? So we're going to do all that, and we're going to do it in a very uh, even fashion, not being prejudiced towards one or the other, not being supportive of one or the other, because I know that this is uh, highly politically charged. We want to do a good job and we want to give the country a good chance to explain why they're doing this and we want to explain why we are recommending this or that. But in a word, you do want to see more flexibility from the United Kingdom government. We are saying that um, with this medium-term strong anchoring of fiscal consolidation. The pace has to be adjusted depending on the circumstances. And given the weak growth that we have observed, observed lately because of reduced demand addressed to the economy, now might be the time to consider. 
but we want to have the dialogue. You see, I don't want to, I don't think it's fair on any of our, member, of our members, we have 188 of them, to actually pass the final judgment. Uh, we, and, and the words used matter, and the grammar that is applied to words matter. So when we say, may consider, we, we are opening the door, but it, now is the dialogue. I want to quote you some words from a former senior IMF staffer, Ashoka Modi, who led the IMF mission in Ireland. Uh, he says this now, he says that in his view, austerity only was a policy that was mistaken. And he says lessons must be learned because otherwise there will be unending human pain, a culture of national dependency and a fraying of Europe's economic and social fabric. And when you look at what is happening in Spain, in Greece, in Portugal, where the Constitutional Court has actually just chucked out uh, some of the measures the government was taking to try to follow the austerity program, when you look at all of that, do you think that he's right? You know, austerity is not an end of its own. It wouldn't make sense to actually, you know, put in place austerity and, and full stop. Uh, what the objective is, at the end of the day, is stability, in order to be conducive to growth, in order to create jobs. Now, we are a long way away uh, on countries such as Spain, such as Portugal, such as Greece. But those countries uh, have uh, really had to put their public finances in order. And, you know, I was, I was not managing director of the IMF. I was minister of finance at the time. When we saw the numbers coming out for Greece, for instance, it became very obvious that something very serious had to be done. And the same went for other countries as well. I just wonder whether in all of the bailouts, and maybe we should focus, before we move on from Europe, focus briefly on Cyprus, the most recent mm -hmm. Eurozone bailout. Probably the most difficult as well. Yeah, and whether you are hand on heart proud of the role the IMF played in that bailout. You are trying to imply that uh, it was so difficult that I cannot say that I'm proud of what we did. Uh, I'll no, tell you something, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the team that actually put hours and hours and hours, night, night, days and weekends, trying to help the country that was finding itself in such a difficult position and which had really sort of delayed uh, the curing of the problem by securing a loan that took them out of the market for you know, a year and a half so that they would not have to actually deal with it. Had they done it a bit earlier, it wouldn't have been as complicated as it, as it has been. But so am I proud of it? Mm. As I said, I'm proud of the teams, and the teams have done as good a job as they could under the circumstances of a very, very difficult case. I'm happy to go into the details well, of how difficult it was. Let's not spend too long on it, but just two brief specific points. First point, um, you became, the IMF became a party to an initial plan, an initial rescue deal, which of course ultimately the Cypriot public absolutely rejected, but, but a, an initial deal which was going to cost even small bank depositors a significant amount of money. It seemed to break a fundamental trust about the security of small savers and their banking deposits. Do you regret that? I regret that we did not uh, explore sufficiently uh, the bind, if you will, between the, uh, the members of government and the uh, persons who were negotiating on behalf of the country and actually the, the, the sound deep down um, views by the population. Uh, you know, it's, uh, just, to, just to remind ourselves, we're talking about less than a million people, 0.2 of uh, uh, the Eurozone's GDP, a banking sector that was you know, eight times the size of the country itself with massive deposits including from non-residents from various corners of the world, mm -hmm. and uh, a restructuring of banks that was absolutely needed because the banks were broke, sure, right, but, if they had but, not but been the restructured. you initially came up with... Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't come up with but it. But you signed on to it. You were a party to it, which, yeah. frankly... No, I don't renege on that. I, you know, we, you, but, we but, but were it, part it, of To it. quote one leading European commentator, it drove a coach and horses through the big idea of banking union because, in the end, when push came to shove and the Cypriot banks were falling apart, the message to Cyprus was, it is your problem. And we will offer you some money, but you are going to have to bear the brunt of the pain. And of course, we found out three weeks after the initial deal that there's going to be much more pain. I mean, the Cypriots are facing the most unimaginable burden mm. to pay off 
for the, the price of this rescue deal. Stephen, just to remind you, first of all, all the accounts with under 100,000 euros are totally protected under the, under the deal that is in the, place the now. Deal. Okay, yeah. yeah, so all those accounts are protected. And some of the accounts in one bank are going to take a haircut of about 37%, uh, the big accounts. And the other, one, the other ones are going to go through a bad bank, good bank process so that over time and maturity, uh, they will recover some of, of, their, of their deposits. So that, that's point number one. My take on it and my read on it, because I'm looking at the future, is that this Cyprus case, as small as it was, as difficult as it was for the various reasons that I've mentioned, some of them, will hopefully convince the Europeans and particularly the members of the Eurozone that a European banking union is an absolute necessity and has to be put in place quickly. Because had there been a banking union in place, the common supervisor who is in charge of not just looking at the big guys, but also of supervising the three largest bank banks in any of the member states, would have seen that there was something funny about this, particularly the two largest ones, growing and growing and growing and growing with a relatively small capital, with hardly any bondholders and with massive deposits. So that would have been one. The second one is that the European system as a union banking system would have helped in the rescue package and would have directed what was to be done. A final thought on Europe, and I promise you I want to move on, but a final thought. <laughs> You've made the point about banking union being so important to stabilizing the Eurozone. Yeah. Well, we don't have a full and proper banking union. It may take Yet. a long time to get it. Mm. George Soros goes further. He said this, he says, uh, in the end, there's no alternative if the euro is to work but to give birth to the missing ingredient, a European treasury with the power to tax and therefore to borrow. In the longer term, is he right? I think he'll be gone by then. <laughs> and I'll, I might be gone too. But to have that as a goal, uh, if, if the, the peoples of Europe and the leaders of Europe have that political objective to turn the currency union into monetary union, which it is now, into a banking union, into a fiscal union, into a political union, that's where they but should go, I clearly. Mean, your, your answer was neat and amusing, but, but the, it raises mm. another question, which is, if it's so far away and so difficult to achieve, isn't the implication that in the interim, the Eurozone is always going to be unstable and dysfunctional? It just means that I'll take my retirement early. <laughs> it's, look, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated structure. There's no, no question about it. You have 17 member states, 17 flags, 17 national anthems, 17 treasury departments with all their people deciding to come together and to have one currency, to have one consistent uh, fiscal policies, to try to set debt ceilings and so on and so forth. Not all of it works, but in times of smooth sailing, the boat is okay. In times of tempest, then you can see that the mast does not hold as well as it should be, that the sail should be rolled in a different way, that you have to put a little bit of this, that and the other around, around the vessel. And that's what's happening at the moment. They need to move faster. There's no question about it. Let's now move off Europe and think of some other very important challenges facing the IMF and challenges facing many of the people here at the spring meetings. I want to talk particularly about one case study, if you like, and that is Egypt. Mm -hmm. Egypt is desperate for assistance from the IMF up to the tune of five billion US dollars. And we see an economy that is in dire straits. And yet after months and months and months of tough negotiation, you still seem to be a long way from offering that assistance. Is that because the IMF has become so preoccupied with stabilizing Europe that it isn't lending the sort of attention it should be to really difficult situations like that in Egypt? No, I can assure you that it's not the case. I, w I was in Egypt myself in August, very shortly after the appointment of Prime Minister Kandil, because I thought it was a very important uh, statement to make to the Egyptian people and to the Egyptian authorities that we were paying attention, that we wanted to be in a strong and productive dialogue with them. And we were on the verge of concluding a program in November 2012, which is by all account really fast. You know, I'm there in August, the team works hard, hard, hard. They go in the field, they spend days and nights working with the teams. They put a program in place, but for political reasons, you know, no, no criticism of it. 
but for political reason, the president and the prime minister had to pull out uh, tax reforms that they were just about to put to the parliament. So what well, do we do? We go back and we return to Egypt. So we've had teams on the ground negotiating over and over and over again. They just came back a few days ago. Uh, there is still a way to go before we complete the agreement because you know, two but things. If I may, yeah, to be, to be, people me, won't know please. the details, but, but to be clear, uh, as I understand it, there is still a lot of discussion about whether the government is prepared, as you want them to do, to uh, curtail, cut back massively on subsidies for wheat, for fuel, things that the poor in Egypt, and let's not forget it's a country full of poor people, absolutely depend on. And this gets to the heart of how the IMF handles negotiations like this. I mean, Joe Stiglitz, the Pulitzer Prize winning economist, he said, the IMF approach, he says they call it negotiation, but the fact is all the power is on one side, the IMFs. And many in emerging economies feel that the way you operate is secretive, it lacks transparency and accountability, and it is fundamentally unfair. I think it's a, a fundamentally unfair comment. Seriously, because everything that we do is approved by a board representing the 188 members of the institution. So it's not as if you had a group of secretive top economists, you know, cooking up their little thing on the side, stuffing it to the country and then putting all the hardship on them. It's, it's number one, far more complicated. Number two, it's a constant dialogue. Number three, at the end of the day, it's the program of the country itself. You remember my point about Cyprus. You need to have political uh, buy-in. And that's one of the things that we want to have in Egypt, which is why we talk with the government but we also talk with the opposition because the elections are down the road. And in the meantime, we have very few people to talk to that will say, yes, we want to do that. One point on, this, on the subsidies, because I think it's a really important one that we, we care about. Do you know how much money is spent on subsidies around the world today? Two trillion dollars. Two trillion dollars go into subsidy. If you look in the details of who gets the subsidies, it's not so much the poor people. The bulk of the subsidies actually go to people who don't really need it. When you talk about energy, it goes to people who have air conditioning, who have several cars, and who take the benefit of, subs of subsidies, because most of those subsidies are designed across the board. Anybody has it. Those who really need the subsidies, the poor people, they get a little chunk of it. So what we're saying to Egypt, for instance, is redesign Make sure that the poor people have what they need by way of cash transfers, by way of special smart cards that gives them access to some uh, oil because they need that as well. And the rest of it, the rest that goes to those that don't need it, it's okay. We're, we're almost out of time and there are a couple of issues I have to get to before we finish. One is, uh, and it reflects perhaps some of the emerging uh, economy perspective on the IMF. One is this, you broke an incredibly important glass ceiling when you were appointed to this job because you were the first woman in seven decades to lead the IMF. But there's another ceiling that still exists. Every leader of the IMF has come from Europe and particularly now, given everything we've talked about in this conversation, the balance of IMF activity between Europe and other challenges that you mm -hmm. face, surely the time has come to acknowledge the next leader of the IMF should not come from Europe. Do you agree? It may very well be that the next leader of the IMF will not come from Europe. And the, uh, the principle that has been adopted, and you know, it's not reflecting very much on my modesty, so I hate to say it actually, um, but so far the principle has been to hire the best person for the job at the moment. Okay? But let me just Do you move... Do the balance is right? In, uh, on your executive board, I was example. just going to come to that. Okay. Um, we have reforms underway at the moment where there will be shifts from the advanced economies to the emerging countries, to the developing countries. There has already been a little shift. There should be a bigger shift when the 2010 reform is adopted. There will be more shifts because for this institution, for this vibrant group of people who are working for stability around the world, they have to mirror the world. They have to look alike. So we need to have more 
around the table. And I'm very proud to say that we have 44% of our staff coming from emerging market economies right, and developing staff, but countries. Not board members. But, not yet. But, yeah, let, 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 again, a, a quick There's only one. one woman on the board as well. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, let, here's an issue for you as the boss. Uh, no, it, it's for countries. No, no, they, no. They I'm point. moving on. I'm moving to another issue okay. before we finish. And, and this is more personal. Um, there's enormous pressure on you. You've been described as one of the most powerful, well, one of the two most powerful women in the world economy alongside Angela Merkel. And yet you face a very real personal difficulty. Toward the end of May, magistrates in France want to question you about allegations of, and I'm just quoting the technical terms, misappropriation of public funds and aiding and abetting falsification. You've already seen your apartment searched by the French authorities. This is making it difficult for you to do your job, is it not? No, it's not. Because I'm trying to focus 100% of my energy my enthusiasm, my smile on the job that I have to do. And I have the huge privilege of being supported by a team that is not looking at those things that you just mentioned. They exist, I will deal with it, and I will but do I what to, I, I have to, to do. This. If you were placed under formal investigation, would your position here still be tenable? You know, in, at the IMF, we don't speculate on personal evolution of things. And at the moment, I'm telling you this, I'm focusing on what I have to do. And I hope to have demonstrated to you that I'm passionate about what we do and not about, you know, forecasting what my future will be, if this, if that, and what have you. One thing at a time, one country at a time, one crisis at a time. Well, uh, and w in that spirit, a final question is this, you know, you've talked about the three speed problem in the world economy, and you've suggested ways in which you want to focus leaders' attentions to fix it. Hmm. Do you think the world right now has leaders in place, thinking of all the different nation states that we've talked about that are relevant to this, is there the leadership to deliver the sorts of uh, brave decisions on economic policy making that you feel the globe needs? I'm sure there is enough of that. Uh, my real concern is that that leadership has to come together and they have to be able to uh, cooperate, understand what the consequences of what they decide uh, will be at home, but also abroad. We call that scientifically the spillover effect, critically important. In a world where central banks have been pulling a lot of the, um, the, the, the weight of shouldering the crisis, that will be an issue. So they have to really come together. We came together in 2008 at the time of the, of the crisis. Now things are looking a bit better despite these three speeds, the leaders have to come together again and they have to really be attentive to what's in it for them, what's in it for the group uh, of countries and, and to really sort of deliver on that. Cooperation is absolutely needed. Christine Lagarde, we have to end there, but thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You well, so patient with me, Christine. I thank you so much for that. Um, and it, 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 it was lovely to have the time to, to go into some of the detail with you. And I know we spent a lot of time on Europe. But, but ladies and gentlemen, we are not through. And so if you can uh, stay comfortable in your seats, we will continue. And I say at this point that I'm hoping we are going to be joined by uh, a live web stream of my... Um, uh, opportunity to spend time with Christine Lagarde here at the headquarters of the IMF, uh, streamed on the BBC, um, on our website of course, also streamed through the IMF. And this is a chance for us to go interactive with the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund because this is not about me asking my own questions anymore. We've had enough of that, I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, now we have a chance for some of you to question um, Madame Lagarde directly yourselves. We've got an audience of delegates uh, who are here at the spring meetings of the IMF with us. We also have, for several days, been receiving a large number of tweets from people who wanted to put a direct question to Christine Lagarde. And we're going to mix up the two and have perhaps 15 to 20 minutes opportunity to continue the conversation. I'm going to start here in the room because it's only polite, as you guys uh, have turned out to see us today. I'd like to get a first question uh, from the floor. So if any of you would like to take this opportunity to put a question direct to 
Madame Lagarde, do please raise a hand right now. We'll start at the front, as the microphone is already there. Sir, brief as you can, introduce yourself, tell us your name, and put the question. Yes, uh, my name's Stephen Percy. Uh, I work at the International Labour Organization. And uh, I'd like to ask a question about this three-speed uh, uh, world. Uh, I think from the, the point of view of, the, of working families, they'd also see three speeds. Uh, I think a lot of people in a lot of countries would say, I haven't had a wage increase in real terms for years. I'm worried about my, uh, my job. My sister just lost hers. And that would be most countries. Uh, wages are going up in China, but it's one of the very, very few. Um, then there'd be a group of countries where, yes, uh, wages are creeping up. Uh, I could probably get a job if I lost this one. And then those two groups would see a very tiny minority uh, who are doing extremely well, uh, chief executives, mainly in the finance sector. Uh, in your New York speech, you, uh, you said that we need to communicate uh, on the issues that people really care about, and you said growth and jobs and equity, uh, and I'm just wondering who's listening. Well, you know, I, I think we should, on those issues, we should just never give up, and we should keep at it. I remember back five years ago uh, in, um, I think it was at the Washington G20 summit and then the next one uh, in London, there was a lot of discussion about the non-cooperative jurisdictions. And then the thing was sort of taking its course and uh, going through the, uh, uh, the difficulties of signing uh, X agreements to be off the blacklist, of the gray list, and da 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 it's being reactivated. And I was just now in the, uh, in the G20 meeting where there is a strong push for going a lot further and a lot faster on the non-cooperative jurisdictions, on the offshore financial centers. So that, that's, that's a good thing. So we should never lose hope that somebody is listening and that the issue will, will, will be coming back. On that one, because I have to stay you know, as, as technical as I can and, and root my remarks on the work that is being done by, by our teams, there is evidence that more inclusive growth is going to be more sustainable growth. So when all the leaders uh, acclaim solid, sustainable and balanced growth, yes, sustainable, you have to make it inclusive, which means that the, the differences and the widening of the differences that we have observed lately has to reduce in order for that growth to be sustainable. And I'm delighted that we work with the ILO on some of these issues. Right, well, th thank you for that. Um, I I've just been looking at a, a whole list of, of, of tweets that um, we have received. And I it's interesting to give you just a little r rundown on where they're all coming from. We've got hundreds here uh, that have come in from the US and from the UK, but also many from the developing world. We've got messages coming in from South Africa, Egypt, Nigeria, China. Uh, got some from France. We've got uh, Rwanda, the Netherlands. We've got... Um, at least 27 more nations where people have actually sent in questions. We can't obviously go through them all. Here's one uh, directly concerning Africa. Um, somebody with the tag Africa Love, so we know where their loyalties lie, says, why is there impunity, no sanctions against the IMF when their prescriptions uh, for our countries make the country's economic situation worse? Do you see what he's getting at? Well, he he believes not, some of yeah. your prescriptions have made the situation yeah. worse in some African yeah. countries, and he says, where's the accountability? Yeah. Well, first of all, the IMF belongs to the members. Okay, so it's not as if it was me or, or, or you know, the staff, uh, but it, it's an institution that belongs to, to, to the world, okay? I would tell you something else. I was very concerned that there was that feeling uh, particularly in, in Asia, because that's a part of the world where we have done a lot of uh, um, support. There has been a lot of programs and conditions and so on and so forth. And I know that it was very hard on some countries. I know that there were moments when inflation went through the roof, the currency went uh, to, the, to, the, to the basement, and, and people lost their job and so on and so forth. So I wanted to go back and to understand you know, what, what people felt about it and, and whether there was resentment and whether we, we were persona non grata. In many of those countries, I had people say, it was hard, we hated you, but it's a process that we had to go through and now we are much more solid and better off having resisted the crisis. So 
You know, it's hardly surprising because we are not invited in countries where things are okay, when governments have sure. done what they had to do. We are generally invited as the, you know, the, the, the fireman and, and the architect at the same time. And we have to begin by being the fireman. Quick other tweet and then we'll get back to the audience. This one, uh, what does Madame Lagarde think of the proposed establishment of a BRICS bank to rival institutions like the IMF? You know, it's not to rival. That's the beauty of it. And there are many uh, similar institutions around the world. The Asian countries have put in place a, a, an arrangement amongst themselves. Uh, Russia and a few of the Central Eastern European countries have done that as well. And uh, it, it's and the Europeans. Look, look at the Europeans. They also have put in place a special mechanism. What we are putting in place and have in place with the Europeans is enough of a memorandum of understanding so that we can work together. Because when a country is in trouble, it doesn't only take one institution. It takes four levels. You have the national level, where things have to be fixed and done. You have often bilateral arrangements with swap lines and things like that. You have a regional level, quite often and more so now. And then you have the global level of the IMF that can come in with expertise, with funds when necessary, technical assistance afterwards, and where we are actually trusted to do that work however unpleasant it is now and again. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, now, anybody in the audience who would like to take this opportunity? Um, we've had one at the front, I will come to you, but let, let, let's take a, a, a lady at, toward the back, behind the camera. I'm pointing at you, madam, yes, you. If we can get you a microphone. Come here. And just again, if you, uh, it was actually the, the lady I was pointing at just behind there, thanks, sorry, sorry about that. Tell us your name and a very brief question. We are short of time. Very brief, please. Uh, my name is Bisan Kaseb and I'm Egyptian. Uh, I want to ask Ms. Lagarde uh, if she, she was speaking about the public agreement and, uh, the, of the pol and the political powers agreement in Egypt uh, besides the government uh, about the loan. Uh, do, do she think right now there is such a public agreement? I'm speaking more, more than the, the political powers. There are the ordinary people. Until now, the ordinary people um, say we know nothing about the loan because uh, the Egyptian government uh, says nothing about it. How, how can she make sure uh, the Egyptian public um, do, do agree with the, with the loan uh, while she knows that the, 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 the Egyptian government uh, doesn't say anything about what's happening in the negotiations? Um, plus, um, don't she s she's a little afraid of an assumed um, um, uh, political transition again in Egypt uh, regarding all the demonstrations right now, doesn't it um, affect her, um, her and the uh, and the funds um, uh, decision about the loan? Let thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, the two-pronged question, really, yeah. but do you okay. want to take that? On on, on the first one, uh, it, you know, w we need to talk to 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 people who have uh, the numbers, who can commit, and therefore we have to rely on on political representatives. But we do more than that because we have that issue of not reaching out to the people. So we not only talk to the government in place, we talk to the opposition. And beyond that, we try to reach out to civil society organizations. So we try to talk to unions when there are unions in place. We try to talk to uh, various associations, representatives of uh, uh, employers, representatives of women groups, of you know, all sorts of representatives of civil society in order to explain what we're doing. But at the end of the day, the program is going to have to be carried, owned, implemented by the authorities because it's no longer us in the field, on the ground, have, doing the job. It's going to have to be the authorities themselves. So we very strongly recommend to the authorities to actually communicate to the people, to go on television and say, okay, this is what we're doing. We're going to have to do this, that, and the other. We think it's good for the country, and that's where it's taking us. And it will need additional donors to actually come and, and help us to go through that phase. That's question number one. Question number two, we have to rely on, on, on numbers, on facts, on empirical data that, that have to be communicated by those in place. And it is true that in a country in transition, you have to assess that on the basis of those who generally have done the job for a long time. But you know what? In countries in transition, we've often observed that the administration, the people who you know, crunch the numbers, who are looking at data, who are generally way behind the scene 
are actually loyal to their country more than to a team or another. So that, that's what we've observed. But I really take your point, and uh, you know, as we are working at the moment with the Egyptian team, we'll, uh, we'll you know, take that on board and see how we can deal with it better. Right, well, I'll, I'll keep things moving along because we don't have much time left. Uh, Professor Steve Keane has, has uh, tweeted this question. Brief as you can, if you would, Madame Lagarde. Well, what role do you think that private debt played in causing the global economic crisis? As opposed to sovereign debt, you know, there, we know um, huge sort of asset bubbles. Well, it, it played, a, it played a, a, a massive role in the first place, which is what prompted uh, the sovereign to actually embark into rescuing private institutions. Yeah. 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 Um, now, uh, right, well, goodness, we've got lots of hands. Uh, lady here, and then we'll go over there, I promise. But if we can get a microphone. Yep. No, just wait for the microphone. And then brief as you can, please. Okay, my name is Aviva. Uh, I'm a PhD student at American University. Um, earlier this year, the HSBC made an advertisement in The Economist. Uh, when history looks back, the year 2013 will be the year of RMB. So what do you think? RMB, Chinese currency. RMB, yeah. So what do you think the role of RMB in the near future? Thank you. Well, I would observe briefly that, uh, because you could talk forever about, about the uh, internationalization of the currency, the opening of the capital account, and this, that, and the other. But I would observe that the, uh, the Chinese currency has been uh, following a trend, which in our view is, is appropriate. It has appreciated gradually over time. And uh, we, we see it, to use you know, quoted language, as moderately underappreciated. Uh, which I'm reassured by Chinese authorities will continue to be addressed uh, in the, in the coming months. And I'm also observing that there are more and more swap lines being negotiated between China and some of its trading partners. So it's heading in that direction that I mentioned at the beginning. OK. Uh, just to be clear about that, are you suggesting that uh, China, you talk to them a lot, uh, is China doing enough to, to address the trade imbalance issue and, and doing enough to really stimulate domestic demand. You know, if, if you look at the, at the current account of China, it has shrunk significantly since the beginning of the crisis. Okay? It was in, in north of 11%, uh, if mm. I recall, and it's slightly above 2% now. Now, some of it has to do because you know, they have less demand, less clients buying from China. But some of it is also structural. And we, we're hearing from the Chinese authorities that yes, they want to redirect their business model, less so on exports and more so on their domestic market with a good and fair balance between investment and consumption. That it's on that latter part that we, we still are in need of seeing results. Right, I fear time is uh, against us. So we'll bring in one more question uh, and then we may have to close our session. But Madam, go for it. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Madam Lagarde, thank you so much for your wonderful work. I just wanted to thank you for being a good leader and uh, a, a wonderful person. Uh, what I wanted Thank you. to, yeah, I yes, hope you've that, been that, that's so <laughs> out of your office. You've been there with us as a woman, and uh, I congratulate you for your wonderful work. Keep up your good works and answering questions so perfect and well. So, what I wanted to say, uh, when you look at Africa uh, and the economy, and now that with its resources and uh, countries like China and other countries are going to Africa. Well, how do you rate that economy of Africa at this time and those that are going to Africa? And we want more women like you to be involved in money issues. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, wh when I, I look at Africa, I look at a kaleidoscope of different countries. And I don't want to draw sort of a general statement on Africa as a continent, because there are so many different situations between the countries that have resources, countries that don't have resources, countries that are blessed by nature and that can harvest uh, massively, you know, sometimes twice a year, and those that are affected by drought. So I see each country on its own having different, you know, settings, characteristics, and, and, and future. And in the main, the countries of Africa have done better in the last you know, a few years, and they have traveled through the crisis uh, much better than some advanced economies, for instance. No surprise, will some say. They don't have a big financial uh, sector um, in place. And maybe that was a blessing in disguise uh, for the situation as it, uh, as it unfolds. I would caution, though, 
because I think we need to be very careful of two things. One, not to waste natural resources, but manage them well and manage them for the good of the people, not for the good of a group of people, not for another party, but for the good of the people. And let's try to avoid both the sort of resource trap that you know, uh, is a threat to many countries and the middle income country traps that could also affect some of the African countries. But I'm, I'm so encouraged to see some of the development that we have in place. You know, we have 20 programs in place in Africa. So we are walking, working hand in hand with some of our African colleagues and some of the African uh, countries. So well, I cross my fingers yes, for Africa. Yes, indeed. And it, it's wonderful to end on a very positive note. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish it weren't so, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. I mean, I, I haven't done justice to, to the tweets, and if you're watching on the web, I apologize oh, for that. We but will answer but them. we have a plan. Uh, the IMF, uh, Christine Lagarde and her team are going to look at all of the tweeted questions and try and get back to as many of them, maybe in some groups, but get back to as many of them as possible over the coming days. So that is going to happen here at the IMF. Um, I would just, before we finally close, say you can watch the full Hard Talk interview with Christine Lagarde uh, on BBC World News on Monday. It will be broadcast this coming Monday on the BBC World News Channel and on World Service Radio as well. So please do watch that. It was a fascinating encounter for me. Um, I want to thank everybody here at the uh, IMF headquarters in Washington, D.C., in particular our great audience who've been with us for the past hour, but most of all, uh, I want to thank the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde. Thank you so much for joining us, giving us so much of your time. It has been indeed fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Christine, <laughs> I am so grateful to you. You've been so patient. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, that sort of ends formal proceedings. Thank you for being with us for so long. Thank you for doing, following all my instructions. And I wish you a very good day. Thank you very much indeed.